All right, so some quick announcements. Uh, project two has been released. In fact, checkpoint one was two days ago. Um, it was a lot shorter when I could say yesterday. Uh, when I wrote this announcement slide, it was yesterday. Um, so hopefully you all got it in. Um, and hopefully you're not having too many challenges with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously make sure you reach out if you are having trouble and uh, hopefully we can fix it. Um, one thing that just came up in a note, uh, the, just keep in mind that the grader that's in the, like the project notebook itself, much like the labs and the homework, it just checks for what we usually refer to as like syntax validation. So it just checks that, that you like put something in quotes if it was a string or assigned it to the right variable name or whatever. It doesn't actually check the, the answer, like it doesn't check for the quality of the answer. So it won't be telling you if it's correct or not. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, so you'll, you'll potentially see different results if you post it or when you uh, run the grader in the notebook versus the results that you run when you do it in Gradescope. Um, if you, in Gradescope, get a bunch of errors, you might want to think about resubmitting. I don't know, just throwing it out there. Um, okay, so uh, the other thing is in, I don't know, I'm gonna make this up. Uh, it's completely unrelated, but in celebration of Diwali, uh, no homework this week. Um, so, uh, and just kind of have the, the week off from it. Uh, we do have the other project going on, so we figured it'd be a little easier. Um, unless anybody wants to do a homework, then I'm sure we can come up with something. Um, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Thanksgiving is in a couple of weeks. Um, we do have class on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, I am going to try to do something like an interesting example, um, more than covering necessarily new material. Um, so it should be interesting. Um, but hopefully not mission critical if you for some reason need to be out of town or something like that. Um, but we obviously will not have class on the Thursday uh, because that's actual Thanksgiving. Um, and hopefully everyone will be enjoying turkey, you know, tofurkey, uh, a turducken, you know, whatever you like. Um, all right, I think we've exhausted my bad jokes for the day. Well, for the moment, uh, so we'll move on. Any questions? Anybody have any things they want to bring up? All right. So a little bit, I think we went through some of these slides already, uh, but a little bit of a review on them. Um, so what do we want to do? Um, you know, if we have access to the full set of data or the census, we calculate the parameter directly, or if we're able to calculate the parameter directly, that's always the better choice. Everything over here is an estimate. Okay, so um, we kind of have two approaches to that. We take a random sample um, of an existing data set that we know is good and hopefully complete. And so we take a random sample out of that uh, and then we can kind of iterate across that and get a, uh, you know, figure out some statistic that's an estimate and then calculate that statistic. Um, the other way we can do it is we uh, do what's called bootstrapping. We're gonna talk about this some more, but um, where we, have some existing sample data that we collected somehow. Um, and then we take samples of that data. The key difference between the first example and this one is that we take those samples. Remember, how do we take samples off of a data set that is incomplete and we want to do an estimate? with replacement, that's correct. So in the first scenario, we do it without replacement because we just want the same distribution of data uh, just kind of rearranged. Um, in the second one, we wanna kind of introduce some more randomness in a sense by taking samples of that existing data set, usually the whole data set, uh, because normally when it's small, it's, you know, it'd be perfectly fine to calculate the parameter off of it, but it's not, we don't consider it complete. So we usually will take a sample off of that whole thing, but with replacement. So we may get repeats. We may miss some of the items in the original sample. Uh, and basically the pattern just continues. It's kind of like this step is the only part that kind of changes. This stuff just continues to be the same. And uh, just kind of more keyword stuff. Um, the estimate is variable, right? So it can change. 
Okay, we use the word variable a little bit interchangeably here, right? We use variable to mean both, um, you know, a name for something, and we use it to also indicate something that is um, not random but changes, right? Uh, so then the error is random, and the parameter is considered fixed, okay? Because it's uh, you know it's a known quantity. No matter how many times you run that calculation, the parameter will be the same, okay? Uh, because, uh, you know, assuming you don't do the math wrong, it is just, you know, math, it's just arithmetic, um, whereas the random is the error, and then the variable is, is going to depend on your data set or your samples, for example. So talking about bootstrapping, so this is the technique where we um, take an existing partial sample, uh, and then we use that to bootstrap a set of samples so that we can make an estimate. Um, we carefully, right, collect that sample such that it's as random as possible so that we don't, uh, so when we resample off of it, hopefully it represents the population, or actually the original sample should represent the population, you know, just a microcosm of it, um, and every resample should also represent the population, uh, you know, assuming we did decent sampling. Uh, can somebody give me an example of where taking uh, you know if you're collecting that data let's say we're trying to get the salaries of boston employees um what might be a bad idea for how to collect one you know item of salary data aside from just making it up if you if you go legitimately to a person that you know works for as a government employee or the city of boston employee and you want to ask them their salary what might mess up your data what are some examples of ways you can mess up that data Given a few examples already, like in the past. Um, any ideas? The more ludicrous, the better. All right, so I'll give one example. Hopefully, somebody will come up with another one. Um, let's say I only collect my sample standing outside of an elementary school. Okay. So I, you know, all the Boston Public School employees are, um, you know, employees, uh, you know, are employees of the city. So therefore, they have salaries that are examples of, uh, you know, salaries of people who work for the city. The thing is going to be skewed to what elementary school teachers make, right? Um, although you could ask the students, but hopefully they don't make any. Did you have another example? Right. So, so one way you get a non-random selection of people, right, is by being in a particular place. Um, you might be much better off, like, say, standing outside a grocery store. You might have some skew, right, because of the neighborhood you stand outside in, right? Um, but if you stand outside a grocery store, it doesn't really have anything to do with the employees of Boston, per se, okay? However, most people go to grocery stores, grocery stores to shop. Uh, so if you stood outside and said, hey, are you a Boston employee? Um, and they say yes, and you collect a sample of their salary, or sorry, an example that's going to go into your data set of their salary, that's probably pretty good, right? Um, the key a lot of the time is like mix it up, right? You know, maybe do a grocery store in one neighborhood, you know, do a convenience store in another neighborhood. Um, you also have to keep in mind, right, Boston employees may not actually live in Boston. Yeah. Right, if you go to a Whole Foods in Back Bay, or you go to um, uh, Market Basket, that's what I was looking for, Market Bas Basket in Dorchester, uh, depending on the part of Dorchester, let's say Roxbury, uh, you might get very, very different results, right? So uh, keep that in mind. However, going to both might be a good idea, right? Because it's gonna it kind of balance out your skew. So you really need to think about where that data is coming from, um, and both in your own sampling, right? But then kind of going back to the Milwaukee example with the election, um, looking at other people's data, right? Think about where it's coming from. How is it skewed? You know, how is it being calculated? Um, you know, always question what people, anything that someone purports as, you know, God's honest truth, you know, with no caveats whatsoever, 
usually you want to start questioning, you know, except for me, of course. Uh, all right, any questions? Okay, so again, a bootstrap is exactly the same as the other kinds of calculations we've done before or estimations we've done before. It's just that when we take the sample, we do it with replacement and we know that the data set is incomplete. So trying to explain my pretty pictures again. So when our population is open-ended and we don't know very much about the population itself, we go and collect the sample. Um, and sorry for the word collision here. You know, we both use the term sample when we go and like collect the data, but then also sample when we do this activity, right? Um, so what we wish we had, you know, if I put this at the top, I probably wouldn't have screwed this up last time. Um, but we wish we had the actual population data set. And so then we do a sample without replacement, pull those samples, and then we can start to calculate like medians or means or other things that we want to know about that population um, by sampling out of our larger data set and then using the whole set of re-samples or sample, you know, new samples um, to uh, help us calculate that. Right to look at the to kind of spread out our our messiness. Um, however, when we don't know the population, um, but we do have theoretically a good representative sample, if we pull with replacement and we pull, and this is important, it probably should be in the slide, right? We have to pull the whole data set, right? Even though it's with replacement, we want to make sure we're doing. You know, our example was three hundred here, right? We want to do three hundred there, three hundred there, three hundred there. Uh, otherwise, the math starts breaking down, or it breaks down worse than it would be normal, because it's not perfect. This is obviously less good than doing it off the real population, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Hopefully, anyone nodding. I know it's three. We need. We need. Maybe we should have like a pot of coffee as you come in. Um, all right. So the bootstrap principle, um, and that's kind of the formal name of it. Uh, but bootstrap world sampling and real world sampling are roughly equal. Uh, so therefore it's not always true, um, but if the sample, if the original sample is large enough, it should come out pretty well. Um, and we hope that basically these things happen, right? So that the variability of the bootstrap estimate and the distribution of bootstrap errors is roughly the same as what it would be if we had the natural population. All right, so key to resampling. Um, and as you can see, right, it should be the same size as the original one. Um, and so the two estimates are comparable. Um, you know, I'm sure in kind of the advanced statistics world, we can figure out tricks around this. Um, but, you know, for the vast majority of cases, if you can do it, just resample with the same size. All right. Um, however, if you notice when we took at the employees, right, we had the original population. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that our whatever it was like 30,000 records is not a complete sample set. We could start to mess with this a bit, right? Let's say that was too big to calculate. So we could start using bootstrapping mechanisms to pull a sample out of that of say 300. Although with that big a pool, I would probably try for more like 1,000 or 3,000. Um, and we can actually resample off of the 3,000, let's say as long as our original sample is what we're using for the calculation, not the original population. Does that make sense? So the key is that they all have to be the same size to actually compare legitimately. Um, some of these things, I think it's like, if you, if you kind of look at it, the, the, your kind of gut tells you that this is the right answer, right? That they need to be the same size. Otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, however, you know, your gut is often wrong when it comes to like mathematics and programming and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to validate it here that even though it seems obvious, it is actually the case. All right, so getting on to new stuff. Does anybody know what a confidence interval is? So this is probably one of the trickiest like concepts um, in kind of this class, um, not so much because it's difficult to understand what it is, it's, but it's quite difficult to understand what it isn't. Um, and so, you know, at least I find it particularly confusing. If you don't, hey, more power to you. Um, but I've always found this kind of challenging. 
All right, so before we kind of start, um, just a rehash, right? A parameter is fixed, but unknown quantity associated with the population. And an estimate is a number, but it's an approximation based on random sampling of the parameter. Um, so if we have a narrow confidence interval, it's more likely to be accurate, okay? And if we have a broad, it's a broad uh, confidence interval, it's more likely to be less accurate. And the reason I bring those terms up um, because a confidence interval is an interval, right? So a chunk, okay? So if it's bigger, it's less accurate. If it's smaller, it tends to be more accurate. Um, and, but the terms for those are usually narrow and broad. So that's why I bring up those, those two words. All right, so 95% confidence interval. So the first part, right, is that we did this kind of like mechanism to go and try to do an estimate. So what we're saying with the 95% confidence interval is that the interval, okay, just that the interval contains whatever it is we're looking for 95% of the time, okay? So if you're thinking of it, like you think about a histogram, right? We talked about the tails on the edges. So kind of throwing out the tails, we talk about the bulk of it in the middle. You know, if you pick a random thing in the histogram area, right? 95% of the time, it's gonna fall in the middle, right? You know, or somewhere not in the tails, okay? So that's kind of what we mean by a confidence interval. Um, and sorry, and the 95% is like the number is the confidence level. Um, and it could obviously be any percent between zero and hundred. That's why it's a percentage. Um, but a higher number means a wider interval, right? So, you know, if we, if we somehow got this down to a 5% confidence level, that means there's just that little piece inside that like histogram of medians, which we've looked at, you know, 50,000 times now, um, where we know that the real world median is, okay? Um, we don't know exactly what it is. We just know it's in that little tiny space, okay? But more commonly, it's more like 95% because we're guessing, right? So it's gonna be somewhere in that 95%, um, but it could be, you know, and we'll talk, I think, the next, yeah, in a few minutes, we'll talk about another example uh, where we have a real world data element like this. Um, and so the confidence is in the process that gives the interval. So, uh, and basically, so that that interval, right, it's gonna, if you think about one of those samples, actually, maybe we'll go to this slide first. So if we know that the real answer, right, is this median dollar amount, this red line, okay? This confidence interval, right? So basically this window here contains this red line 95% of the time. So uh, like here's an example right here. I don't know how you can see it, where it does not, it's not in there, right? So you can see for the most part, right? The yellow line crossed the red line, right? Or, hey, maybe it's 95% of the time. So that's where, that's kind of what we're talking about. So we're not saying at any given place, right, that it's 95% accurate or something like that. It's that when we do these samplings, 95% of the time, it will be in that range. Okay. All right. So. Um, and as we brought up last time, maybe, um, I'm going to start posting these notebooks. I'm going to try to go through basically all, all the way up through lecture 18 tomorrow, uh, unless y'all come and visit me in office hours. Um, so I'm going to try to bang through all of them and post them uh, so you can see kind of the the correct versions from the classes, um, or my cheat sheets, basically. So, let me just switch windows around so I can read this. Um, and run this one, and run this one. 
All right, so uh, all we're doing here is just kind of setting up my example, um, which is that uh, table of Boston salaries. And we're going to pull a sample off it. Um, actually, first, what we're going to do is pull out all the salaries that are above minimum wage. Then we're going to pull out the population median of itself. Okay. Then we're going to build some bins around it for the histogram, basically, just to kind of set up, right? And then if we're doing a bootstrap, the first thing we need to do is because, like I said, we're going to pretend that those 300 are the only people we interviewed. So, but we're going to pull them with um, no replacement, right, uh, out of the original population set, just so we have a unique set of 300, as if we had walked around and gotten three good examples, or sorry, 300 good examples. Um, then we're just going to, for kind of the sake of uh, comparison and that kind of stuff, we're going to pull the median of that sample, the original sample, um, in, and then build some bins for the medians. Um, so. Basically, all we did was we created this, right? Okay. Um, all right. So now people have to help me. Um, so, how do I get my first resample off of our original sample and to do a bootstrap? So, we're going to do something that looks like this. So can anybody tell me what else I need here? Oops. Exactly. Um, in fact, right, you might even want to say, like, think about something like um, uh, whatever it is, num rows um, here, right? Like, be absolutely sure, certain it's the, the correct size. Um, but yes, exactly. All right. So now we want to make a histogram off of that um, using the, um, sorry, using the bins that we created uh, above. Uh, so we do something like this. So we take a histogram and then we have some uh, nice explanation content that we'll just drop in here, which is not, you know, relevant to the actual activity, but we want to see. So, you know, this is kind of like build from base, right? Take a look at what you're trying to do. Make sure you're in the right ballpark. Then we're going to make pumps. Okay. So we make our uh, first bootstrap sample. So this is a sample with replacement off of the original data set or off the our, like our fake sample. Um, and here we have the population median is 96,000, uh, but the sample median was 100,000. Um, and then this bootstrap sample median was 93,000. So, you know, it's kind of around where we want it to be, which is kind of nice, but. Not perfect, um, but obviously if I run uh, this multiple times, right, I'll get different results, both for the histogram and this bootstrap sample median. These two, which are just our kind of comparisons to kind of show what we're doing, you wouldn't normally, well, you would have the sample median, but you wouldn't normally have the population median, right? Um, but we are showing these numbers just for comparison. But every time we run this, we would get a different histogram and we would get a different bootstrap median. Um, unless you know all the stars aligned and magic happened and um, our random didn't work. Okay, so now we know it's right, or we know it's doing what we want it to do. So what do we do next? We want to make a function out of it. So we're just going to take a single sample. And our sample, oops, 
our sample. And then, so when we said, um, we passed in two parameters right here above, right? How many parameters do we have to pass in? Does anyone know? You say one, what is it? Uh, no, but good guess. Um, so it's gonna default to the full thing. So you don't have to pass any. Um, so by way of convenience. So just to be clear, that is not the kind of thing I will ever test on. You know, if you have too many parameters, that's a good thing. As long as the parameters are right, right? In some ways it actually makes the code more readable, things like that. Um, so, you know, but it is kind of nice to know that you can get away with making things a little simpler. Um, so then we're gonna return the, basically the median um, off of the total earnings from our newest sample, right? So we get that. And now what do we want to do to, oops, sometimes I hate that space bars page down. Um, so now we want a thousand of those. So how would I do a thousand of those? Yeah, but how would I, how would I code that? For yeah, for I in oop, NP dot A range, and we're gonna do a thousand. Um, don't forget the stupid colon. Um, and then we're gonna get a new median every time, and we're gonna call our function. No parameters because we're just kind of doing the same thing every time. Um, and then we need to add that to our uh, set of medians, right? So, so anybody remember how we add it to the existing array? So I already made the array of bootstrap medians. Um, so how do I get this uh, piece in there? Append, all right. Can you give me more than that or? Nice, exactly. Uh, all right, so that's all we're gonna do in that line. Um, so now we have a big, huge array, right, of medians from running a bunch of samples against that original data set. Um, and basically now we're just gonna display it essentially exactly the same way we've done in the past. It's just that now we're using the bootstrap medians and then for the sake of understanding it better, right? I'm just gonna drop two dots in here. Um, the red one is the um, original population median, right? And this is the original sample median, okay? And so, you know, it kind of looks right-ish, you know, um, but it kind of goes around that. Um, and we're gonna talk actually about uh, standard deviations next time, I think, um, like we should get to that point today. Um, and so there we go, right? So there's a bootstrap. It's basically exactly the same technique we've been using all the way along uh, to do uh, an estimate of the medians of the correct population, right? So now we can say with you know some level of knowledge, right, that the median salary looks like it's um, you know actually right around hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, even though we know our real population data is actually about 90, uh, 96, maybe thousand, 97,000. But that's the problem with only taking 300 right out of our 30,000. Um, we probably should be doing it off of, you know, at least, like I said before, at least like 3,000. Um, but, you know, for the sake of the example. All right. So now we talk about the confidence intervals. So now what we want to know is what that interval looks like so that we can have an idea 
of kind of the quality of our guess, right? So what we drop in here is this yellow line, which is which is the confidence interval of you know our answer. And our answer at the moment, right? I think it's blue. Um, yeah. So well, that's the sample median. Um, so that's kind of our answer. Um, and here is this yellow line. Does anybody know how? Once it's super obvious. Yeah, uh, Carol. It's kind of obvious, but all right. Does anybody know why I have the lines? Okay, so I have left and right as basically the positions for the endpoints of the yellow line. Okay, so how did I get? Why did I choose like that method to get left and right? What what is the what is the reasoning behind using percentile two point five and percentile ninety seven point five? If we're looking for a 95% confidence interval. We have a guess. Yeah. Right. So, so we know we want to throw out 5%, basically, right? So we're going to say the tails are about 5% of the tails we think are just not, you know, are super close or not interesting. So, we're going to cut five and a half and we get two and a half. So on the first side, on the left side, we just take the two and a half percentile. Um, and then on the top side, right, we want to subtract that from 100. So we get the 97 and a half is the right side. Okay. So if we wanted to say a 90 percentile, right, we would just say five and 95, right? And now we get a tighter confidence interval here because we're throwing out more of the edge cases. It's less likely to be consistent, right? So if you go back, if we go back here, I'll show you. If we go back to this slide, it means we're going to have more of these yellow bars, right, that do not touch the red line. Okay. So that means if I run a random experiment again, I only have only have a 90% chance of having the red line in it. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why these matter. All right, and we are now directed to go back to the slides. Um, just wanna see if there's anything else on this slide. No, okay. So everybody following so far? So, these yellow bars are the confidence interval, and the confidence level is kind of the like the percent we're not throwing out, right? Um, all right. So, um, and I don't think I talked about this yet, but if you look at the Pfizer COVID nineteen vaccine um, testing that they did, um, and this is from the CDC site, um, but from a bit ago, so these numbers may have changed if you go look it up now, um, but at one point at least, it said that they're estimating the vaccine efficacy, okay, um, which is slightly, you know, it's a, it's a very specific medical term, but for most of us non-med, you know, doctors, um, basically 95% effective. Um, however, if you notice, and this is one of the things I think people miss on this vaccine, is that if you get COVID, it reduces your, your hospitalization likeliness um, by 95%. So it helps you avoid it, but what they were really testing for is whether you're gonna have to be intubated, right? Or whether you're gonna have to be hospitalized uh, if you do catch it, um, at least in this particular part of the study. So, uh, so what they report here, and this is kind of interesting. So. Uh, you don't see this a lot of the time, sadly, um, but they're reporting their confidence level. So 95% confidence level. So 95% of the time. Um, and then the confidence interval, um, you know, is right around what you'd expect it to be. Okay, so between 90 and 97%. Um, and so what this is trying to say, right, is that the CDC is 95% sure that the median of the people who get the vaccine 
inflammatory, asymptomatic will fall between 90 to 97%. So in other words, if you get the vaccine and you catch COVID, you won't have symptoms. Okay. Um, and, but they're 95% sure that the median of those people will fall between here and here. So it's not that 95% of people will be asymptomatic. You understand the difference? What it's saying is if you do another sample, right? So if they do another study, they have 95% confidence that the median of the asymptomatic people will be, uh, sorry, the median of that group of people will be asymptomatic. All right? So it's kind of confusing, um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems we have in uh, science, right, is that scientists like to be accurate. Uh, and a lot of people who don't understand whatever the science is, right, I'm not a medical doctor, I gloss over some of the terminology they use, et cetera. Um, you know, even though I consider myself somewhat of a scientist, I'm not that kind, right? So even for me, I'm gonna kind of gloss over it. What I want is an answer like 95% of people will be asymptomatic, right? period in the story. That's the kind of answer I want. Sadly, they don't, the doctors, right, the, the statisticians and the, and the, you know, research doctors, et cetera, um, don't know a way to give you that answer. So what they give you is an approximation that's pretty good. They can give you a fair amount of confidence in that approximation um, of something near what we want to know. But it is a distinction. Um, and as some people often say, right, it is not a distinction without a difference, right? It is actually different. Um, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I went and got my booster today because those numbers look pretty good to me. All right, so these hopefully are relatively obvious if you want to make that confidence nar interval narrower, you have to lower your confidence level or increase the original sample size, okay? So, you know, if we had our 30, you know, assuming for the sake of argument, which I have really no idea what the answer is, but assuming for the sake of argument, there are 30,000 Boston, uh, you know, city employees. Um, if we go and get a sample, right, we go and find 29,000 of them, we're gonna make much better bets on the accuracy of that data than if we go and get 300 of them. Right, that makes sense. So bigger sample size, more likely to be right. Um, and uh, you can also lower the confidence level. So you can go from 95% to 90 to you know, 85. Um, I don't know, uh, Graham, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say it's very unusual to have less than 90%. Yeah, usually when you report confidence, 90% of the people are like the one that most people trust. Yeah, right. So. So 95% is kind of the most common. You're going to see lots of caveats and stars and everything else if the number is different from that, um, because that's usually what they're looking for. All right. So here is another example. We'll talk through a bootstrap again. Um, and I gave you a bunch of hints about the questions I'm going to ask, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to answer them easily. Um, but so if you remember, we were talking about this uh, maternal smoker data set thing. Um, what do y'all think? So this is uh, whatever it is, 12, no, uh, 1179, 74 uh, mothers who either were a smoker or non-smoker when they were pregnant. Um, and then had a kid. Do you think that is a complete set of the population of mothers who gave birth to children in whenever the year it was? No, right? Like that would be ridiculous. Um, maybe post World War Z, I don't know. Um, so we know this is a sample. So in other words, they probably went to a few hospitals, right? And they, they asked, they literally asked people. Um, and so, this is a really good example of we don't know our original population. So here is as if 
we had gone to the grocery store and stood outside and asked people if they were Boston employees. Um, but in this case, we went to hospitals and asked mothers who had just given birth whether or not uh, they had been smokers or non-smokers while pregnant. So what's the first thing we want to do with that data set to kind of get a sense of that, generally speaking? Any ideas? Yeah. That would be, I would say that's the next step after this. So yes, but what, like, we just want to visualize it, right? So we're just going to do a histogram. Um, but in this case, actually, we're going to look at maternal age, mostly because I know the example works well. Um, but so we see a histogram um, and, you know, this kind of tells us that most of the mothers in this sample set, for example, were between 20 and 30, um, and uh, which is kind of interesting. And so what we want to do is look at trying to figure out what is their average age, okay? Um, so how would I get to the average age of this sample set? We've done this a whole bunch of times. So let's say, like I said to make my code work later, we wanna just, all we want is the average age of the mothers in this data set. So how would we get that? Um, one thing I, I thought was interesting kind of going through some of the course material or whatever, we have basically covered all the Python we're gonna cover in this class. So everything that you've done so far, that's basically all the Python stuff we're gonna cover. It's really, and what's kind of interesting about programming in general is programming gets really interesting because you can actually take a really relatively small number of things that you know how to do and do really spectacular things. So you may not feel like you know a ton of you know, Python at this point, um, but it is actually sufficient pretty much to do everything else we're going to do in this course. So, you know, it's pretty powerful at a really small data set. All right, so how can we do the mean age? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I am going to actually let me just print that real quick. Um, I'm going to sidebar here for one, oh my goodness, second into a slide. Um, so you chose np.average. There's also np.mean. Does anybody know what the difference is? Okay, so I have a slide for that. And because it came up, let's jump to it. Oh boy, I should have jumped more effectively. I don't have a slide for it. I lied. Look at that. Hopefully, I'll read really fast. Um, there were questions in there, so uh, okay. So I totally thought I had made a slide. Um, so there's NP mean and NP average, um, and the reason I bring it up is: Has anyone ever heard of a weighted average? Okay, so a weighted average basically is that some of the items in your average are more important than other things in your average. Okay, um, and it's basically used. I can't think of a like kind of a normal reason, but it's usually used uh, when you're doing kind of more advanced statistics, or whatever. So average um, that function lets you do things with weights, uh, whereas mean doesn't. So, but for all intents and purposes, basically you can use them interchangeably here as long as you don't go passing weird parameters about weights, okay? Or axes, which is another really weird thing to get into. Um, but just kind of keep in mind, even though there are two there, they do serve two different purposes. It's just that we're not gonna use them both. Um, and by default, they both do the same thing, which is provide you know, a mean or an average of the thing you pass into. It. Uh, all right, so that would be better if we had the slide. Um, 
All right, so now we know what we're doing. So let's make a function to make it easier to do it. So what will we do here? Um, any... So remember what we're trying to do is we're gonna bootstrap again. Okay, so we have our original sample, uh, which is whatever it is, let's call it 1200 rows, give or take. Um, and so what we wanna do is we're gonna go loop against that and create a thousand samples. So, and, but we don't actually care about the samples, right? We only care about the mean or the average of the sample of the ages in the sample. So what can we do for a function that will be kind of as efficient as possible uh, to calculate that? Ideas? And the reason I clarify about the, we don't care about what's in the sample per se, is it means once we leave this function, remember we've talked about scope, we want it to just go away. Like we don't, we don't care about the sample itself. Uh, so therefore we can reclaim the RAM as quickly as possible um, by leaving the function. So what can we do here to get uh, the, you know, the average of a new sample set off of our original 1200 elements? The answer is literally staring at you in the face. Just above. Ideas? Right. So I switched to mean because it's shorter. So, oops, I forgot. Sample. Yeah, sorry. So, right, so you think about uh, kind of how arithmetic does parentheses, right, is how this works. So the first thing is kind of the, the most inside. Um, I, know, I guess it's not a great example, but, um, you know, so we're going to do the inside set of those parentheses first. Um, and so we're going to get a sample. Uh, so we're just going to pull any, we're going to pull with replacement, right, off of that original 1200 rows out of first. Um, then we're going to pull out the maternal age that we get. So this might be, it'll be some sort of mismatch of the original sample. And then we're just going to pull the mean off of it. And then as soon as we leave this method, that sample goes away. Okay, so it just disappears. Which is good when we're talking about doing a thousand of them at once. Right? Um, all right, and so then we're just going to loop for a thousand iterations, just like we've done 67 times. Um, Except we're only going to do a thousand, not ten thousand and one. Um, and I forgot the colon. So it's basically just like we did before, except in this case our data set is probably more interesting because we don't know anything about the original population. Um, and then we're gonna print some niceties here, right? So we're still going for 95%. So we get two and a half on one side and we get two and a half on the other. So we get a left and right, takes a second. Um, and then I just printed them to make it a little clearer what was going on. Uh, so, do it off our own data set because uh, I don't think there's anybody in the data set that's 90,000 years old. So my guess is I grabbed salary back. So yeah. That's what I was wondering. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, here, right? Yeah. Yeah, 
Aha. What's the problem with command completion, right? And then I fixed the wrong one. Am I doing something? Oh, maybe not. Yeah, there we go. All right, much better. Because uh, 90,000 year old mothers is, seems odd to me. Maybe it's just me. Uh, all right, so it looks like they're just shy of 27, so 26.9, and up to about 27 and a half is our average ages. All right, and then we can take a look at it and we get a nice histogram. Um, pretty well distributed, right? Uh, then we're gonna talk about standard deviations later. Um, so our, let's see what colors we got here. So our mean age, which I think is what we just, So yeah, so the blue dot is our original mean age uh, off the original sample, okay? And then this is the yellow line that is the interval, right? So if we run the sample again, we have 95% confidence that the uh, mean will fall somewhere between what looks like, I don't know, call it, oh, it should be like that 29 number, that was like, uh, sorry, 26.9 number. Uh, so it should be right here and 27 and a half, so that it'll fall somewhere in there. Okay. So what's interesting about that, right, is that um, the age range here is actually pretty small, right? It's only about half a year. Um, but our confidence interval is still 95% within that relatively small age range. So depending on the data set, that 95% can be actually, you know, sort of feel right pretty narrow, even though technically speaking, it's the same width as the one we were talking about um, uh, for the employee's salaries. All right. And then I think we go back to the slide. Yeah. All right, we talked about that, talked about that. All right, so left hand, right hand, uh, and then there's, there's both hands coming up. So that should be exciting for you. Um, how much time we got left? 15 minutes. Okay. So, sorry, let me switch windows here. Um, So by our calculation, an approximate 95% confidence interval for the average age of the mothers in the population is 26.9, 27.6 years. So is the, this a true statement? About 95% of the mothers in the population were between 26.9 years and 27.6 years old. Is that a true statement? So right hand up for yes, it's true, and left hand up for uh, no, it is false. Any more hands? Remember, you're just getting participation grades on this, so it's not like anybody's going to tell you you're wrong. Um, or if anybody does, let me know and I'll yell it. All right, any more hands? All right. So the answer is false. We're estimating that their average age is in this interval. Okay, so it's not that they're that old. Okay, it's that their average age is that old. Does that make sense? All right, there could be a 40 year old mother in there, right? There could be a 15 year old mother in there. Well, let's not say that. Let's say 20 year old mother. All right. All right, here's another one. So same deal. So if it's true, raise your right hand. If it's false, raise your left hand. There is a you know, 0.95 probability that the average age of mothers in the population is in the range 26.9 uh, and 
years of age. All right. That side of the room apparently can't see the screen. There we go. Thank you. That is also false. This one I think is trickier. The average age of the mothers in the population is unknown, but it is a constant. It's not random. There's no chance involved. So this is where it gets a little pedantic on terminology. Okay. So I find this, like I said, not only a little bit confusing, but also kind of annoying. Um, not as bad as colons in Python, but you know, in the same vein. Um, so but yes, it's not random. So we know that there is a constant average age for all mothers who give birth, period, end of story, okay? Um, but our sample set doesn't necessarily know what that is. All right, uh, so here is when we shouldn't use a bootstrap. Um, and I should have made this a build slide so I could have asked all of you uh, when you should. But so when trying to estimate very high or very low percentiles or min and max, um, so like when you're trying to do weird stuff, it doesn't work very well. Um, uh, and then when you, again, like kind of this is another one, it's like where you have, an, I was trying to think of a good example of this, but I don't have a good one off the top of my head. Um, but so like if the, if the thing you're studying, right, is, is heavily affected by a rare element, you know, actually the smoking example is probably a good one. Uh, since the increase in pricing on uh, packs of cigarettes over the last whatever it's been like 10 or 20 years or something, the uh, rate of people smoking has actually like significantly dropped, at least in the US, right? Um, you know, now we, we have uh, people uh, with vaping. I was like venting, no, um, who are vaping and now having all kinds of nicotine addictions again, but whatever. Um, so, but it has massively dropped. So, Doing this kind that weight study these days might actually get kind of screwball because the population of smokers, particularly mothers who are smokers, is so it's gotten so small, right? Um, so that's kind of a rare element of the population, right? It's gotten really, you know, they're they're really outliers now, um, or probably I'm just guessing, obviously. Um, so if the probability of the distribution is not roughly bell shaped, okay, so. We'll talk about uh, standard deviation, like I said, I think it's next time. Um, but, you know, most of our histograms, right, kind of look like this nice, pretty bell. Um, and if it doesn't look like that, it's going to get weirder. Um, and, but what's funny is that, like, this third bullet is very, very close to saying the same thing as the first two. So the first two will usually indicate something that's not very bell shaped. Right, because you're going to have all kinds of weird spikes on your data set. So it's not going to be very bell shaped. So they're kind of all saying sort of the same thing. If you don't have a relatively uniform population, it's going to be weird. Um, and also, and then lastly, the original sample is very small. So I was going to fool around with doing uh, left side, right side sleeping that we did in the surveys, right? But excuse me, that our population sample is actually very small. We can't, it's very difficult for us to say anything excuse me, anything interesting about the kind of general population of sleepers based on our sample set. It's just too small. So even if we try to do bootstrapping against it, it's still not going to be particularly representative. Um, and like I was saying before, the employee salaries thing, pulling 300 out of that, probably not representative of the data set. All right. So uh, what's interesting, right, is that we can use these techniques, right, to do our um, our hypothesis testing. Sorry, blanks on the word hypothesis. Um, and so we talk about those p-values, right? And so, uh, for example, this is where that confidence level starts coming. In, okay, and so we can we can do the same kind of thing. We can use that same technique we were talking about with hypothesis te testing and use confidence intervals. Um, or kind of another way of describing this is confidence intervals, or maybe it's kind of like the complement when we were talking about um, percentages, you know, is like, it's kind of looking at the, the same, using the same kind of technique, but from the other direction. Uh, so, you know, if you take your p-value, you'll get a confidence left, uh, 
Yeah, okay, so this is not terribly well worded. Um, but basically, you know, normally, right, a p value is like five, you know, or five percent or whatever. So you get to your 95 percent confidence level. Make sense? So this is really just kind of tying it back to the hypothesis testing we were doing before. Um, it just, you know, we're, we're kind of like circling around all the same thing uh, from kind of different perspectives. All right. Um, and actually, let's skip this. Um, I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, okay, so we talked about this a little bit, um, but if we have, uh, you know, uh, this set of numbers, um, then we can get to an average. So a couple of things, um, you know, we kind of did this for median last time, time before that, relatively recently, um, and talking about the difference between like the NP median and the median we're using mostly in this class for the percentile. So like the NP median, but unlike the percentile, it does not have to be a value in the set to get the average, right? It can just be, you know, kind of arbitrary out there. Um, hopefully that actually the average. So I think I calculated it, but now I can't remember. Um, it also need not be an integer, even if the data is integers. Um, and then somewhere between the min and the max, um, but doesn't actually have to be halfway, right? Um, so, you know, unlike the median, which will be halfway in the middle. Um, and then this one uh, can be a little confusing, um, but same units as the data. So not the units of the items, but if those were, each of those was miles, this is 4.25 miles, okay? So the average or the mean will always be the same unit of measure um, or whatever, same unit of whatever it is as the items in the average. Um, and obviously, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to average kilometers and miles, right? So you don't mix the units together. Uh, maybe you could take the two averages, right? Um, and then, generally speaking, um, and I saw a really good example of looking at what are called smoothing operators. So looking at averages to uh, kind of smooth out or get to, to pretty lines. And... I didn't have time to pull one of these together, but if you look at like a stock market, a stock line, right? Or uh, Bitcoin is really entertaining right now. Um, you know, if you look at moving averages on that, if you look at it at a day, right? It's going to be a really spiky line, okay? Both up and down and everything else. But if you look at it, a moving average of a month, right? It starts getting smoother, right? If you look at it over a year, it gets even smoother. Okay. The thing is, is that you also lose accuracy, right? Because when you're looking at the average, the smaller the average or the smaller of a chunk, the more points you have. And so therefore the data is closer to, to accurate. But if you're looking at like, you know, long-term stock performance, um, you know, something nice and smooth is actually fine because you don't actually care about the, the details of the data uh, at any given point. So I don't know how much you play around with stocks, but uh, that's uh, it's a, just a classic, really good example of uh, kind of lots of different things about how how you look at data, um, because lots of different traders, right, look at data um, in their own special ways, with the assumption that their way is actually going to give them the best insights into the future of that stock. So, um, All right, and so, oh, I did have a slide. I thought so. Okay, so I just don't know why it was a build slide. I'm afraid all the rest of them were just build slides by accident. Uh, so as you can see, MP mean, MP average are gonna give you the exact same answer, okay? Um, it's only when you start passing in other variables that it changes how MP average works. All right, so both hands, right hand, left hand. Um, so for this question, uh, yeah, okay. So is the median of this distribution the same or bigger or smaller than this one over here? All right. So if you think it's the same, put both hands up. If you think it's the one 
and I went back and forth of like, you know, third or fourth wall, you know, all sort of stuff. Like, this is the left, this is the right. Because if you think about it right, from a picture perspective, it's actually reversed. Uh, I got, it really broke my head. Um, so put up two hands if you think they're the same, put up your left hand if you think the one on the left is bigger, and put up your right hand if you think the one on the right is bigger. And this is the median, to be clear. All right. Uh, this, the same Z's have it, OK? Um, because the median, um, it's just kind of in the center, OK? And it's not heavily affected by this outline, OK? How about this one? But this time, we're going to talk about this is the mean. So are the means the same? Is the left one bigger? Is the right one bigger? So, yeah. All right. Everybody got an answer? All right. This one, the right hand side is bigger, okay, because this outlier affects the mean significantly, well, basically at all, whereas the median, it kind of doesn't really affect it as much as the count of them does. You know, the fact that it's way out here or whatever doesn't really make that much difference. It's the number of them. Um, cool, we're almost done. So I thought I'd cover this real quick because I don't think we've really covered it. Maybe it's really obvious, but I thought it was kind of useful. Um, so I wanted to show how do you calculate the mean from a histogram, okay? And technically speaking, you can't calculate it, okay? Unless you have much better data points or lines, right, than I do. You're, you're kind of guessing a little bit based on the picture. But these are my best guesses. So the mean here is 2.5. So it's pretty close, probably. Um, so what you do when you're doing the mean is you take your first window and you basically find the midpoint of it, okay, which is 0.5. Okay. And then you multiply it by the count. And so I guess that was about 11. Okay. And then kind of keep going, right? So the next one over is 1.5, and I said there's 23 of them, and then two and a half, and then there's whatever I said, 33 of those, and you multiply and add as you go on, okay? Um, because we know that's how many there are because it's areas, right? So to get to 257, all right? So that's the total number uh, if we add it all up. Um, and then the way I drew this, I just threw out basically the, the position, right? And kept the counter and we end up with 102, okay? And so then we do the division and we get two and a half. That makes sense? All right, so the median I think is a little weirder. Um, so I kind of wanted to point it out too, but basically, you know, kind of same exercise before is identify like the spots. We got 102 of them. Um, and so, uh, then we divide that by two, okay, so that we can find the middle, okay, and conveniently we got a 51 in this case, so we know there's one spot, um, and so what we do is we add up the count between them till we find the correct column, because we can't actually say what the median number is per se, I mean, we kind of can, but it would still be, it'd be very much an estimate, right, um, but we can say, well, it's definitely in column three, because that's where the 51 lands, right? So we just know it's somewhere in here, but we don't actually know where exactly it is. Like I said, we could guess, but uh, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, just to close it out, um, and you guys watch out, there's more left and right and thing that's uh, later. Um, so comparing median, median, mean and median. Uh, so the mean is the, uh, you know, basically the average of the histogram um, and the halfway point of the data is the median. Um, if it's symmetric, they're gonna be like either the same or really close, right? And so if it's literally symmetric, they're gonna be the same, um, <clears throat> you know, but if it's near it, it'll be nearby. Um, if it's skewed in some way, okay, like that graphic I showed before, 
where we had that outlier, they're going to be different. Okay. Um, and depending on where the skew is, one will be greater than the other. Make sense? All right. Let's call it.